Facilities, Environment, and Climate Committee will come to order. It's Monday, March 27th, 2023, 1230 p.m. Uh, we're at 1150 at the Minnesota Senate Building, and a quorum is present. Good afternoon, everybody. Today's agenda includes Senate File 1984, Senate File 3030, and then the Energy Utilities, Environment, and Climate Finance Omnibus Spreadsheet. Just for everyone's information, our intention is to hear the two bills, then walk through the spreadsheet, and come back on Wednesday with the intention to pass the spreadsheet once everybody's had a chance to comment and offer amendments. And with that, I'm going to give the gavel over to Senator Zhang, and we'll hear Senate File 1984. Chair friends, welcome to the committee and to your bill, Senate File 1984. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Proud to present Senate File 1984. Um, this has to do with the needs of schools to address HVAC, both from a public health standpoint, um, from an energy efficiency standpoint, and from an airflow standpoint. But first, Mr. Chair, I would love to have the opportunity to move the A2 amendment. All right, Senator Friends uh, moves the A2 amendment. Uh, Senator Friends, to your amendment. Members, the A2 amendment creates a, a pilot program of $1 million that will allow schools to be assessed and will allow work to be prepared to improve the heating, venting, air conditioning programs for, for Minnesota schools. Again, the benefits of this would be better air quality, hopefully providing better public health, um, efficiency, which as we know helps us reduce carbon emission and reduce costs, and then airflow carries with it certain benefits to the student in the educational process. As you can see in section three, subdivision one, there's a $50,000 per grant limit. Um, this can be used for equipment upgrades, replacements, measures to improve anything that improves health, safety, or efficiency. And the appropriation is $1 million. Uh, there are some testifiers, but first, Mr. Chair, I would ask that the A2 amendment be added. All right, uh, before any questions? Chair, uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Frentz, I'm curious as to technical functions behind the bill. 1984 is not in the Energy Committee's hold right now. It was introduced, referred to education, then withdrawn and re-referred to Commerce and Consumer Protection. I don't know logistically how we can be making votes on the bill that's not actually in the Energy Committee. I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Senator Friends. Why, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. I did have the impression that it was before the committee, but perhaps we could refer to Council. Uh, to Senate Council. Mr. Chair, members, um, my understanding is that this bill is being given a hearing so that the committee can discuss it. Amend it, the language. Uh, it is true, I'm just verifying as I am speaking here. It is true that the bill is, this Senate file 1984 is not in this committee right now. And so it would not be possible to amend this bill and send it somewhere else. However, a version of this language is in the omnibus bill. And so I think the chair's intent is to give this bill a hearing because it's going to be in the bill that we're going to be discussing a little bit later today. Uh, Senator Matthews, any further questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was trying to discuss with Council right before um, asking here and just running out of time. So I understand uh, that it's in the later DE and you want to have discussions on it. I just am not sure the committee is actually authorized to make votes on Senate file 1984 with it not being uh, legitimately referred to the committee at this time. That's the point I was trying to bring up. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Noted, to, uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Mathers. It's an excellent point. And uh, to your bill, 
Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Again, hoping to improve the school HVAC environment. We have three testifiers, and I believe Mr. Beery is the first on the list. All right. Uh, can I have Mr. Colin Beery uh, come up to the testifying table along with uh, Mr. John uh, Kornstrom? Mr. Beery, you may uh, please state your name and you, you may proceed. Chair, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I also believe I was asked for a little bit of technical support for a quick overview of the bill. So if uh, it makes sense, uh, I'll do just a high level quick testimony and then move through the high level uh, of the bill review. My name is Colin Beery. I handle government affairs for Local 10, uh, the sheet metal workers. I'm here to speak in support of Senate file 1984 as amended. Our 5,000 plus members work predominantly in vertical construction, fabrication, installing, upgrading, maintaining HVAC systems. We see the creation of the air ventilation program as a step forward to addressing energy efficiency, human health, life safety, and cost savings. In so improving the full indoor environment in school facilities. We ask the committee's support in Senate file 1984 as amended and would like to add our many thanks to the bill's author. Uh, moving forward now on a high level, uh, and I'll stand for questions afterwards for any technical assistance. Uh, the grant program uh, goes over uh, its guidelines. So uh, in the grant program, it outlines grants awarded for reimbursement uh, performing a physical assessment, work perform, pox, uh, also including possible fixes, additions, upgrades to the ventilation system. Uh, also, it outlines grant awards uh, in, the quality, in the qualifications for work performed by skilled trained workforce, reimbursements to school after HVAC ventilation report, outlines compliance with listed requirements, on assessed systems, prioritizes support to Title I funded schools, uh, grants reimbursed 50% of the costs incurred to the school, and then guidelines and rules. So adoption of uh, the program guidelines, established timing of the grant funding, technical and reporting ability to be amended, uh, funds to be administered by the program. So that's just real high level. Uh, Again, I will stand for questioning moving forward on any technical support of the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beery. Uh, next, Mr. Kornstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, honorable committee members. My name is John Kornstrom. I am the CEO of the Sheet Metal Air Conditioning and Roofing Contractors Association. Uh, we are a local trade association with 200 plus contractor members that perform HVAC work in Minnesota. Uh, I am here uh, to support Senate file 1984 in its original form and as its contemplated amended form because of the importance of indoor air quality in schools. Over the last couple of years there's been a lot more focus on the importance of maximizing the number of air exchanges, maximizing air filtration, and ensuring that ventilation systems are operating as designed. When an HVAC system is working properly, there's reduced exposure to airborne viruses, including COVID. Their uh, good ventilation has been directly linked to lowering CO2 levels, which improves the learning environment. And finally, an HVAC system that is operating as designed will be more energy efficient. Uh, state dollars likely will soon be available to schools for determining whether their HVAC systems are operating as designed and all of the air exchanges that can be achieved are achieved. Senate file 1984 ensures that the indoor air quality assessments will be performed by qualified personnel that are knowledgeable on commercial HVAC design and operation. Senate 1984 ensures that any needed repairs and revisions will be performed by qualified personnel. HVAC systems in schools include mechanical fire and smoke dampers, electronic controls, and unfortunately too many occupants that attempt to improve their own comfort air by making their own adjustments. 
Uh, these systems are more complex than a residential system, and that's why we believe there is a need for qualified people to perform the work. Most indoor air quality assessments will find a need for adjustments or repairs to get the system to operate at peak performance. We support Senate File 1984 because using qualified personnel to perform indoor air quality work provides the best opportunity re for return of state dollars being invested in schools. Nice job. All right, thank you, uh, testifiers. Uh, next we have uh, Jeannie Atchison and John Bosch. Bashy, 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 sorry. It's that wrong. Uh, Ms. Atchison, uh, could, pl could you please state your name and you uh, may begin your testimony? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Janie Atchison. Uh, hello, Chair and Committee members. Uh, I am a sixth and seventh grade teacher currently on leave from St. Paul Public Schools as a member lobbyist at Education Minnesota. My classroom that I left last week. Uh, was built in the 1930s as part of the WPA program. This means the temperature is controlled by a boiler system during the colder months, and there is no air conditioning during the warmer months. Research studies from Harvard, Stanford, the National Bureau of Economic Studies, as well as countless others, have shown what any of my students already know. As temperature rise, learning decreases. In June of 2021, my classroom reached 94 degrees. Here's a photo, I took a photo of it. Uh, my students were absolutely miserable. The night before, the district sent a message to their parents encouraging them to send students with a damp cloth and a water bottle to help cool them during the day, as if those two items could combat the effects of sweltering heat. Due to safety and liability concerns, my classroom windows only open three inches and half of my windows don't open at all, which allows for minimal air circulation. I was not provided with a fan from the districts and, and teachers had to bring in their own fans if they wanted one. Multiple teachers attempted to make swamp coolers in hopes to just cool a section of their room or bring the temperature back into the 80s. I asked this rhetorically, but how much work would we all get done in this room today if we cranked the temps past 90 degrees added high humidity, and had almost no air circulation. My best educated guess is that we would try to get things done as quickly as possible and then leave. My students and I did this for seven hours for multiple days. According to the National Bureau of Economic Studies, for every one degree increase, it is a 1% decrease in student learning. And if you're trying to test a student on those days, you might as well forget it because all the research shows that students are unable to test well in the heat. My school, my school district is not alone. The American Council of Civil Engineering gives Minnesota student, or sorry, gives Minnesota school infrastructure a C minus. From, from small rural districts to large urban ones, our students are suffering. Minnesota has an extremely old school stock. It is an equity issue. School districts who can pass referendums to pay for new buildings do so. And students whose districts are unable to pass these referendums are forced to suffer. I urge this committee to support this bill so all students in our great state can learn in cool conditions, and I promise you that middle schoolers want to be cool. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Atchison. Uh, next, Mr. Bashi. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Beshe and I'm here on behalf of Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, about some of our concerns regarding Senate File 1984. Uh, ABC represents 330 commercial and industrial contractor members and 20,000 men and women who are part of the 76% of the construction industry that choose to be merit shop craft professionals rather than be in a union. Uh, ABC is not opposed to the underlying purpose of this bill, but our members are concerned with the requirement that these projects be performed by workers who have either graduated from or are currently participating in a registered apprenticeship program. 
Registered apprenticeship is one way of learning a trade, but it is not the only one. ABC has dozens of members who employ highly trained technicians who live and work throughout Minnesota. They provide their employees with in-house craft, manufacturer code, and safety training, even though not all of them are registered with the state. If you're part of the 76% of the Minnesota construction workforce who are not in a union, the odds are you are not in a registered apprenticeship program. It would essentially be prohibited right off the bat from working on the projects covered under this bill. Merit shop contractors may choose not to participate in a registered apprenticeship program for a variety of reasons. For example, merit shops often choose to provide in-house training due to the specialized nature of their trades and market. ABC members also employ multi-skilled craft prof professionals who can perform different types of work rather than limiting themselves to one trade. Uh, there seems to be a misconception that a contractor can only perform work safely if they've participated in a registered apprenticeship program. However, we've seen real life examples of how this isn't the case. For instance, the tragic explosion at the Minnehaha Academy in 2017 involved a worker who had completed a union registered apprenticeship program. Despite completing that program, the National Transportation and Safety Board report found that the worker was still not qualified to work on the section of piping at issue. The bottom line is that registered apprenticeship programs are not the sole indicator of a contractor's ability to perform work safely. We're also concerned about the impact that this requirement will have on small and minority owned companies who don't largely participate in these registered programs. Uh, one of our testifiers wanted to be here today but was unable to since the bill was scheduled late last night, but I would like to briefly share some of his concerns. Ken McCreeley is the owner of KMS Air Duct Cleaning in Minneapolis. Ken is a person of color and he has asked me to share the following on his behalf. There are concerns that this requirement will make it more difficult for companies owned by people of color to compete for this work due to the poor track record of registered apprenticeship programs admitting people of color. Ken has 38 employees, all of whom are people of color, and Ken's employees hold a number of required technician certif certifications and have more nationally certified air duct cleaners than anyone in the United States. This requirement will immediately put a hardship on Ken's company, and his employees deserve a chance to work on these projects. If the intent of this bill is to provide direct support to schools and children in communities with high rates of poverty, this requirement will harm the very contractors who reside in the communities that this bill aims to assist. If included in this bill, these additional requirements will act as a deterrent to contractors from bidding and competing for these school construction projects. This will result in fewer bids, which will ultimately drive up the cost. This is not something that school districts or the taxpayers deserve. In closing, we strongly encourage the committee to vote no on Senate file 1984 as currently written. Uh, I understand that this is an informational hearing, uh, and we would respectfully request that the uh, committee consider an amendment that would remove this requirement from the bill. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we those are all our listed testifiers. Are there any other <laughs> testifiers that would like to speak on the bill? All right. Uh, with that, we will open it up for questions. Uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wish to comment on the area of the bill that uh, Mr. Beshe did. Um, and quite frankly, in my district, uh, we have a number of HVAC contractors, and almost none of them have a union shop. So but with this provision, you will preclude them from being involved in their local school's project, uh, and they probably actually installed uh, some, much, of that, much of that system. And, um, and by having to go uh, farther away, they will increase the cost of their project. Is that what your goal is with this uh, um, and then for, the, uh, for the author of the bill? Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Webin. Hardly. Uh, my goal is to see that this work is done on a high level of competence. And I um, heard carefully crafted remarks by Mr. Beshe. I think we want the same thing. And if it's a hardship on a particular area, I think we should be talking about that as the bill moves forward. Um, Senator Weber, follow up. Uh, well, if this bill does move forward, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, if this bill does move forward, I would certainly hope that it would be because there are going to be many districts that see an increase in their project costs with this provision in there. Senator Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber. We also don't want to see costs increase. We want to have this work done for the benefits that we outlined as we presented the bill. So looking forward to those conversations. Thank you, Chair Friends. Uh, 
Any other questions? Uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Friends, appreciate the, the walkthrough uh, on the bill. Uh, I, too, would echo um, Senator Weber and the testimony from ABC. I uh, would urge that we find a resolution to help open it for everybody. Um, the testimony from Ms. Atchison the, with her teacher uh, example, um, kids in a classroom like that don't care if the work is done in their schoolroom uh, by a union worker or a non-union worker. I'm, I'm guessing not a one of them will even think of that possibility. They just want the work done right uh, and get the, get the job fixed. Uh, by whoever is able to make that happen. And I would urge uh, that this bill reflect that and open that up uh, for everybody. Uh, a question uh, that I do have for you, Senator France, at the very end of the A2 amendment um, has line 4.10, has the program administrator may establish rules for the air ventilation program. I'm trying and I'm not finding off the cuff the definition of who the program administrator is. Oh, I just found it. it was, I was going to ask if it was in the Department of Commerce, uh, and I believe that's the case on page one of the amendment. Uh, but I'm wondering if this is the official rulemaking process, if we're giving expanded rulemaking authority to the department, or what we're intending to accomplish with that phrase, if, you'd, if you've got answers, Senator Frentz. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. Another excellent question. Um, it's not the intent for expanded rulemaking, but it was the intent to have the Department of Commerce and the Commissioner be the program administrator. Senator Matthews. Um, so I'm wondering, like, Mr. Chair and Senator Frentz, then, is this going to be going to state gov to look at the rulemaking piece under this? I, I'm, I'm still a little... A uh, little muddy on its purpose or what it's going to be doing as a result of being this line being in the bill. Uh, and maybe, maybe we don't maybe. have the answer for that here today, but I'm throwing these questions out here. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Senator Matthews. Maybe does maybe council can provide us with some answer on that. Mr. Chair, members, Senator Matthews, um, there are, as this bill goes forward, uh, you're going to be marking it up on Wednesday. I assume there will be a handful of uh, technical changes to sort of work through some of these issues, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was addressed, if needed, with uh, one of those amendments. Senator Matthews, any other questions? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, to the authors, because that, that sparked a question with me, because I have all, already have a problem with the rulemaking process that we have uh, when it goes through the agencies. And it looks to me like uh, when you said it wasn't your uh, intention to uh, have the rules adopted this way, but isn't that what this says? That now there's not even going to be the process? To, so if, if the administrator is just going to establish the rule, does that just bypass the rulemaking process? So before we had the rulemaking process bypassing the legislature and, and making it through administrative law judge and then the governor, is this going to remove that as well? Chair Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Green. Uh, again, my intention was to have the commissioner um, establish the rules, I guess, um, open-minded to amendments that would address that and make it more specific. But as I understood the grant program, I thought that was well within the province of the department and did not have any um, concerns about that yet. But if members have concerns, happy to have those conversations. And again, we have the bill up on Wednesday, so not too late to tweak if that is the will of the committee. Uh, Senator Green, any other questions? All right. Um, any closing comments, Senator Friends? No, but thank you. I mean, I think we want the same thing. We want very high quality work. We want to support our schools, and we have both a public health and an efficiency benefit to get for that. Public health good for those kids that are in those classrooms and those teachers. 
and the efficiency, which again, not only saves the school's money, but can reduce the total carbon emissions of the state. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity to have it heard and look forward to its discussion as it moves forward. Thank you all for the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, and so this was an informational hearing, and so uh, we will lay this bill over, or we'll, we'll just move to the next item, sorry. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you. So just to confirm, then, the action we took to amend the bill is nullified. No, no. We, we, we didn't, did, take, we didn't take any action. To, no. Okay. We'll, we'll just be moving on to the next item. Uh, Senator Friend, Senate, we have Senate File 3030 to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. I know everybody is going to like this bill. Senate File 3030 has uh, electric grid resiliency grants. This is going to help uh, members of the utility community with uh, grants that will be awarded for lower rates, environmental benefits, and increase, increase the resiliency. For those members on the committee who had questions about how we would support co-ops and munis when the 2040 100% energy bill was passed, here you go. Um, and I'd be happy to take some time to describe it, but essentially, Mr. Chair, these are grants um, that will help improve resiliency. It is uh, $15 million total with a maximum grant for $250,000. There is a reporting requirement. I think one of the things that we've promised in this committee is that as we require uh, utilities to get to 100% by 2040, if they don't use the off-ramp, that we would be supportive. Here's some support. And with that, um, I do believe that we have the A3 amendment, Mr. Chair. All right, to your center friends, uh, moves the A3 amendment to your A3 amendment. Um, Mr. Chair, members, the A3 essentially describes the things I just wanted. This would be the Commissioner of Commerce administering these grants. It is for consumer-owned utilities. Um, that is, of course, our munis and co-ops. Part of our discussion here was that those smaller municipal and cooperative utilities would have a greater challenge given the benefits of the economies of scale. And so these grants can be applied for and will allow those smallest and medium-sized utilities to get the benefit again, lower rates, environmental benefits, and resiliency. One of the concerns I've heard from my friends across the aisle is resiliency, reliability, and these grants will be used at the uh, application of the boards of these utilities, a group that I've called people's attention to to say, I believe in those boards. I believe they're in a great position to take advantage of these. And at a maximum $250,000 per grant, I believe uh, the boards will say there is opportunity for great support and assistance should these grants become available. Um, the, the report, uh, essentially says that at a minimum each grant awarded in the most recent calendar year and the remaining balance of the appropriation under this section we have um, as you may see looking ahead got an appropriation in the spread seat, spreadsheet and with that mr. chair as you may see there are some testifiers interested in testifying about the bill all right thank you uh, to our first testifier uh, Jenny Glumack and Kent Sulman. Uh, please state your name and you may proceed with your testimony. Jenny Glumack, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Rural Electric Association. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you for having us here. Uh, um, we represent all 50 of Minnesota's rural electric cooperatives who collectively serve 1.7 million member owners roughly one-third of the state's population, and 85% of the geography of Minnesota, which is essentially one-third. Um, cooperatives are not-for-profit dem democratic organizations controlled by their members who actively participate in setting policies and making decisions. We thank Chair Friends for bringing Senate File 3030 forward and appreciate he and his staff's collaboration with electric cooperatives in committee of the session. Cooperatives are leaders in the ongoing energy transition. We are rapidly decarbonizing our generation and working with our member owners to facilitate the adoption of distributed energy resources at their homes and businesses. We are getting there because of technology and innovation. The grant money in this bill will enable cooperatives to continue this goal and put rural electric cooperatives in a better position 
to push our efforts at tra transforming the electrical grid forward while keeping electricity reliable and affordable. Concern for community is one of cooperative principles. These infrastructure investments will assist with our local communities. Grid resiliency will be an important step in this process by enhancing the transmission and distribution grid and working with communities to enhance reliability of service while keeping rates affordable. This could be a number of projects from energy storage to solar to various infrastructure upgrades. Back in January, Justin Johns, the CEO of East Central en Energy, testified on Senate File 4, the 100% carbon free bill in this committee. And I thought this was a good quote to close with. He said, as we continue to move forward with decarbonizing the grid, let's come together around long-term policies that are rooted in practical problem solving, policies driven by technology, incentives, and opportunity. I believe Senate File 3030 does just that. Our electric cooperatives thank all of you for what you do and would appreciate the committee's support. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Kent Solom. <coughs> Please state your name and you may proceed with your testimony. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kent Solom with the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. Association. We represent 124 small communities around the state with their electric uh, power. <coughs> we believe that Senate File 3030 will be a great assistance to these communities that range anywhere from Lesur, Laverne, Lake Crystal to Alexandria and Austin and Staples have already been working with our association asking for help and direction on how to apply for grants uh, to assist with programs that would <coughs> upgrade ut uh, utility equipment, upgrade tracking software, things that would make the system more resilient and able to respond to problems in a quicker manner. Uh, and so we believe that Senate File 3030 would be a very large assistance to our membership. I have been asked to uh, bring up the issue that we're very grateful that it applies to our members and to us as an association, uh, but that perhaps we could find room to amend it to include the joint power agencies as well. I'd be happy to work with the chair on that as this bill moves forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Solom. Um, before we go to, or are there any other testifiers that would like to testify on this bill? Um, before we go to member questions, uh, we would like to vote on the author's amendment. Uh, Senator Friends moves the A3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, mo uh, the motion passes and the A3 amendment is adopted. Uh, to members, any questions from members? Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I just want to understand one of the provisions here. On line point 110 one and 1.11, it talks about permitting grants to utilities or associated trade associations. Um, in what instance would a trade association be responsible for those kind of improvements, if I might ask? Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber. I'm going to refer that to Mr. Sulem. Mr. Sulem. Mr. Chair, Senator Weber, um, we currently are working uh, as a joint effort um, trying to make the job easier in the Department of Commerce uh, for a grant that's outside this program, but the same th uh, philosophy would apply. It allows the association to try to group together projects and keep costs down uh, and simplify some of the paperwork. Senator Weber. Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, any other questions from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is to either of the testifiers or maybe both. Uh, the one question I had with the trade associations, I'm still not quite sure I understand that, but I'll talk to you offline on that. But uh, um, the, the policies that are coming forward that have already even passed and signed, been signed are going to be a, a huge expense to our utilities. And I'm wondering how much of an impact a $250,000 grant is actually going to be in the scope of what it's going to be costing us. Uh, maybe one of the testifier uh, or center of friends. Um, 
Well, first of all, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Green. I believe the testimony from the utilities representative was that it's going to have a big impact, but happy to defer to Mr. Sulum or, or Ms. Glumack for a better description. Mr. Sulum? Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, if you'd like to write a bigger number, we'd be happy to see us to that. Yes. <laughs> but it will, uh, any amount is of value, and we can scale the projects based on what assistance is available. Senator Green? That's pretty funny, Mr. Sulin. We'll talk offline on that. But uh, the the other the one issue that I'll just point out here is that uh, our our REAs, our uh, Rural Electric Associations, are very uh, overregulated as it is. Uh, my small rural electric company, uh, on its uh, by its own, spends ha is mandated to spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars just to send out. Uh, I want to say propaganda, but I don't want to get that nasty. But just to, just to encourage people not to use electricity, they're mandated to do that. And so, um, no, I, I would not be in favor of a bigger number, Mr. Sewell. I'd be in favor of trying to deregulate some of the regulations that are out there now. I think would be a much bigger help than throwing a couple thousand dollars at these folks. Thank you. Any other questions from members? Senator Friends? Closing remarks? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Green, and thank you, members, for the questions. We're trying to do things that help munis and co-ops. Um, this is at the request of and in collaboration with the two organizations right here, MMUA and MREA. And I can tell you, those organizations have been engaged since the first minute this committee convened in January, and they'll be engaged as long as I'm the chair of this committee. And this bill is designed to help them. And Mr. Sulem's uh, point, I think, is, of course, we'd like to have more. Um, but that we can put this to good use. And for some of the municipal electric companies in the great state of Minnesota, they represent small constituencies. $250,000 may not be uh, a pie-in-the-sky number, but it's significant. And the way we envision these grants is that we're going to help. Would we like to help more? Yeah. Stay tuned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Senator Friends. And with that, Senate File 3030 is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, next, uh, Senator Friends, uh, we have your bill, Senate File 2847, coming up. Which, Is that right? Uh, and looks like there's an A9 amendment, author's amendment. Mr. Chair, I have to admit I don't know what number amendment it is. If you say it's the A9, it's the A9. <laughs> and I would love to move uh, the A9 to Senate File 2847, Mr. Chair, now that I know that it's the A9. All right. Uh, Senator Friends moves the A9 am amendment. Uh, any questions from members? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Uh, Senator Friends, to your bill as amended, um, and it looks like we will be go doing a walkthrough of the bill. Yeah, before we do the walkthrough, members, this is an expression of the kind of work we're doing on the committee. We're talking about uh, Minnesota's utilities, Minnesota's energy sector, and the bill reflects our attempt uh, in collaboration with stakeholders, big and small, to put forth a budget given the target that we have to do good things. Several of the members of this committee, both Republican and Democrat, have uh, millions of dollars in this bill. It's my attempt to create a Senate position. I've enjoyed working with each one of you regardless of your ideological lane, and I'm looking forward to us walking through this bill um, and passing it out of this committee and doing good things with the target that we have. Like the municipal utility uh, testimony, I wish it was more too. I think we could do more, but this is a, a very reasonable target given the other priorities of the state. And I think as you'll see with some of these programs, there's a bipartisan flavor to it, including I must just draw attention to the advanced nuclear study that Senator Matthews has uh, put forward that I think represents something we should take a look at. I'm also very open-minded to work with every member of the committee. If you want to change it, um, we can talk about it and as it moves forward to see what we think's best for the state. How's that, Mr. Chair? All right, thank you, uh, Senator Fence. And we'll go to council. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll walk through the spreadsheet um, quickly here, and then we'll quickly go through the language of the DE amendment. And when I get to a certain point of the spreadsheet, I will note that there is an error in the spreadsheet that we'll um, have to fix. 
and then I'll have a new spreadsheet when we come back on Wednesday. But when I get to that part of the spreadsheet, I'll point it out. Um, so as the center friends mentioned, this bill had a spending target of $255 million over the base for uh, fiscal year 24-25, and then $10 million of over the base in the tails. And when I get to page three of the spreadsheet, I'll show how that was met. Um, the structure of the spreadsheet, I'll basically, we have columns that show the forecast, which is what we call the base budget. Those are the first three columns. 22-23 is the current biennium we're in, and then the base forecast for the next two bienniums. Uh, the next set of columns shows the governor's budget um, as it was presented by the governor. And then the last two columns shows the Senate budget, and then there's columns that show the Senate versus the forecast and the Senate versus the governor. So that's the way it's structured. Um, I'll start going through it. There's basically two agents or two main agencies in the base budget here, Public Utilities Commission and then the Department of Commerce. The DE amendment does make some appropriations also to the Department of Ag and the Department of Administration. And I'll show, point those out on the spreadsheet and we'll also go through that when we go through the language. So the first agency on the spreadsheet is the Public Utilities Commission. Um, their appropriation on line uh, five will be going up by about $3.9 million. Most of this is a operating adjustment on line 11 that was in the governor's budget. And then there's some increased uh, amounts that it is going to the Public Utilities Commission for the dispute resolution with utilities from Senate file 658, um, electric vehicle rebates, and compensation for PUC proceedings. And those, all those amounts get added to the PUC's uh, appropriation, and those amounts then are all assessed back to the general fund. So it's a net, um, it's a basically a net zero on the general fund for the PUC uh, additional costs. And then, um, so the, yeah, the, the total PUC, including the special revenue fund statutory changes, um, $24.8 million. Like I said, it's about a $3.97 million increase. Going next to the Department of Commerce, the Division of Energy Resources. Um, so the way their spreadsheet works on lines, uh, let me see, 27 through 54 are all the riders that are in the bill. Some of these are riders that are, were already in the base but most of them are new riders. And you'll see that when you see Senate versus forecast column. Those are all additional amounts that were not in the forecast. Um, so I'll go to the ones that have additions. Uh, solar for schools, this was in the governor's uh, proposal in the governor's budget, and the Senate is funding that at $15 million. Um, the next, and I'll note on the competitive, competitiveness fund, the governor had this in the, the bill. The Senate is carrying this separately in Senate File 1622 that is, um, was passed out of committee and passed by finance, but we are carrying the cost of that bill within this target, and I list that later on in the bill. So that, it shows up as a zero here because it's not in this bill, but we're carrying it um, as part of our target. The next item is the pre-weatherization and workforce training um, at 23.9 million dollars. That's the same that was in the governor's proposal. Strength in Minnesota homes, um, 7.4 or about 7.5 million. That's uh, below the governor. And then we get next are all items that are new in the Senate's uh, proposal. We have the advanced nuclear study for 300,000. Uh, National Sports Center uh, solar array, array and roof. The 850 here from the general fund is just paying for the roof. There's later on an appropriation out of the, out of the renewable development account that is paying for the solar arrays. Clean energy resource teams, 500,000 a year ongoing. Um, high voltage transmission line to North Dakota is 17.5 million. Tribal energy grants, $2.4 million per year and that is ongoing into the tails. 
uh, Minnesota Energy Alley, three million. The Rum River uh, Dam feasibility study for five hundred thousand. Residential electric panel grants, three point five million. There's also money in the RDA later in the bill for that. Uh, distributed energy upgrade grants, ten million. Uh, Climate Innovation Finance Authority, five million. Benchmarking, um, there's three appropriations from that, the Senate file 2295, uh, one million for the benchmarking data use, and then there's grants to utilities for 750,000, and technical school grants, 750,000. Um, heat pump rebate program, six million dollars. Electric vehicle rebates, uh, two million, and also from that bill, two million for the auto dealer certification. Um, on-site energy storage systems, two million. Uh, feasibility study for battery storage, um, 500,000. The electric grid res resiliency grants from the bill we just heard, 15 million. Um, electric school bus grants, two million. And the air ventilation program grants, uh, one million from the other bill that we had the informational hearing on. Um, after that, it shows change items, which basically repeats a lot of the new Senate items. They're all rolled up into the, the lines I just went through, but they're also shown as change items. So I will jump to, um, so the total general fund appropriations under energy resources is $139.787 million. That's $129 million over the base. Um, this bill also funds the Petroleum Tank Release Compensation Board um, in Commerce. That is a uh, one little over a million dollars per year, which includes an operating increase that was in the governor's proposal. Um, one other item I'll note: there was an extension of a uh, assessment sunset. Um, we're showing on line 119. That was in the governor's bill. And it has a two million a million dollars per year cost under the special revenue fund. That is not directly appropriated in the bill. That it just it's a part of a statutory appropriation. Um, next, I'll get to the correction that is necessary on the um, spreadsheet under other agencies. Here we have the appropriations to the Department of Ag. Um, currently, it says 13.392. That should read 12.892 million. And we'll also change that in the bill. Uh, this is for the green fertilizer uh, grants in Senate File 2513. Again, this is being appropriated directly to the Department of Agriculture. The next agency we have is Department of Administration. We have the new energy guidelines. There's a study here for $690,000. And the blank line there on line 137 is for the buy clean and buy fair bill, and that has $500,000. The language in the bill splits that between Department of Administration and, and Department of Transportation. Um, the third page of the spreadsheet shows the revenue changes. These are all just the assessments that are tied to the new spending within the Public Utilities Commission. And for some of the increases at the Department of Commerce, there is also, they're also able to assess some of those costs back. So next we get to uh, total by fund. When you include all spending, including federal funds and everything like that, that's in the budget. It's not necessarily in our appropriation bill, but I just I want to show what the total spending is for this budget area, which includes Public Utilities Commission and the Department of uh, the Energy part of Commerce, when you include the federal funds on line 161, the total spending for this, those two agencies is $564.5 million in fiscal year 24 and 25, and then $443 million in 08. And again, that does not include the state competitive, competitiveness fund that is being uh, passed separately. Net general fund, line 168, again, $147.6 million of new general fund spending that is offset by assessments 
Can you add back the competitive competitiveness fund on line 176? That's spelled wrong. Um, we get to the net general fund target, which should be $255 million. Again, this spreadsheet was over by $500,000 because of an error that I made in we'll, with the Department of Ag um, appropriation, and we'll get that corrected. The last page, the last two pages of the spreadsheets deal with Article 2, which is the rule renewable development account. I'll note uh, the governor did not have any additional spending from the renewable development account in the governor's proposal. So there's no governor columns here. I'm just showing the forecast. Um, going in, I'll note on line one, coming into fiscal year 24, the, there was a 74, almost a 70, $71.5 million balance in the renewable development account. And then you count the, the fees going in for the casks. There would have been about a 90, there would have been about a $96 million um, available in fiscal year 24. There's some language in the bill that increases the solar rewards program from $5 million per year to $10 million in fiscal year 24 and $15 million in fiscal year 25. So that reduces the revenue in the renewable development account by $15 million. So the direct appropriations in Article 2 out of the RDA, some of these were base. There's a couple ones that were in the base. The Maiden Solar Minnesota is not is, was part of the base. Also the third party evaluator. The University of St. Thomas microgrid, the total amount was increased by two. There was an amount that was already in the base of $1.4 million. That amount was increased by $2 million. And then also an additional capacity building and federal match of 4.1 million was added to that appropriation. So the St. Thomas microgrid project will receive $6.1 million additional to what they were gonna get in the base. The solar on community colleges was already in the base, but it's being appropriated in the bill. The rest of the items on down are all new items. The Granite Falls hydroelectric facility for 2.4 million. The other part of the appropriation for the National Sports Center, this part covers the solar array, 4.15 million. Uh, some money, additional money for electrical vehicle rebates of two million, and also auto dealer certification of two million. These will apply only to the, the area covered by the renewable development account. I must add that for all these appropriations, there's language saying that they apply to the areas that are served under the renewable development account. Solar for area C contingency, three million. Residential electrical panel grants, 3.5 million. The emerald ash borer biomass dehydrator, two million in the second year. <coughs> uh, energy storage incentive grants, 10 million. Distributed energy upgrade grants, five million. Heat pump grants, six million. Solar on public buildings, five million, and electric school bus grants, five million. Um, there's a base appropriation for the Department of Administration dealing with the Energy Revolving Loan Fund. That's uh, ninety and ninety-two thousand. And then there is uh, one last appropriation out of the renewable development account is for the Energy Transition Grant Program, and that is at Deed. There's five million dollars for that. The bottom line on the RDA. You'll see on the last page, after the additional amounts for um, solar rewards and the, appro the amounts appropriated in this bill, the bottom there's a renewable development account balance of 15.2 million, anticipated to be 15.2 million at the end of fiscal year 25, and then none of these appropriations carry over, none of the new appropriations carry over into the tails. So the account will again grow um, based on the cask fees in the tails. So that is it for the spreadsheet. I'll take questions if there are any, otherwise I can walk through Article 1 quickly, which mostly ties out to the bill or to the spreadsheet. Uh, 
Thank you, staff. I think we will try to get through uh, all okay. the walkthrough today, and you can proceed with okay. the next section. Mr. Chair and members, I'll quickly walk through Article 1 and 2, which is the appropriations. They match up with the, with the um, spreadsheet, so I won't mention everything again, but I'll just note um, the... The total amounts, again, the energy resources, the total amount appropriated is, is $105.3 million in fiscal year 24 and $34.4 million from the general fund in fiscal year 25. Um, the projects are all listed with riders. I'm not going to go through them again because they, they're all on the spreadsheet. I will jump to page 9 is where we'll make the, the change in the number for the Department of Ag for the green fertilizer grants. Again, that number on line 9.18, 9.19 should be $12,892,000. And we'll incorporate that um, when we come back on Wednesday. Um, and then Article 2 is all the renewable development account appropriations. And again, I won't go through all those because they were on the spreadsheet. And that should be it. I'll let Mr. Stanley take over for Articles 3 and beyond. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, um, Article 3 begins on page 17. This is the Governor's Strengthen Minnesota Home sections. There are two sections, and they require insurance companies to provide a discount for homes that meet fortified home standard requirements, as well as establish a grant program to retrofit existing homes for that purpose. Article 4 begins on page 22. The first section is from Senator Murphy, Senate File 2156. This is by Clean and by Fair Minnesota. Section 2 is from Senator Dibble, Senate File 2201, requiring sustainable building design guidelines for state buildings to incorporate resiliency guidelines. Section 3 is from Senator Mitchell, Senate File 1296, requiring payment of a fee for charging an electric vehicle in the state capitol complex. Sections 4 and 5 are from the same bill, establishing a preference order for the purchase of state vehicles. Section 6 is Senator Hoffman, Senate File 747, requiring payment of the prevailing wage for RDA-funded projects. And that'll take you to the top of page 35, where you'll see section 7, which is from Senator Mitchell's Senate File 2876. This increases the amount that has to be allocated to the Solar Production Incentive Program. Section 8 is from Senator Murphy's Senate File 1778. This is the Area C Contingency Account language. Sections 9 through 11 are from Senator Frentz's Senate File 1984. That's the bill you had an informational hearing on uh, a few minutes ago. Section 12 is from Senate File 1296, requiring dealers of new motor vehicles to employ at least one person who's familiar with EV issues and had related training. Section 13 is from the same bill, and it requires public utilities to submit transportation electrification plans to the PUC and to implement those plans. On page 45, you'll find section 14, that's from Senator Port, Senate File 2993, creating the Electric School Bus Deployment Grant Program. Section 15 is from Senator Francis, Senate File 2688, providing for the transition of the Community Solar Garden Program. Section 16 is from that same bill and imposes a new distributed solar energy standard on the public utility subject to section 116C.779. Section 17 is a technical change. Section 18 is from Senator Dibble's Senate File 658, modifying the PUC dispute resolution procedure. Section 19 is another section from Senate File 2688, requiring a utility to consider distributed energy resources in its resource plan filing. At the top of page 60 is section 20. This is from the governor's bill, raising the assessment PUC can charge for grid reliability analyses. Section 21 is from Senator Zhang, Senate File 2460, 
This authorizes PUC to compensate participants in certain proceedings before the Commission. Sections 22 through 27 are from the Governor's Bill establishing a pre-weatherization program. On page 68, section 28 is from Senator Mitchell's Senate File 2295 requiring energy benchmarking. There is one change from the bill as you discussed it in committee that I'll note here on page 69, line five, uh, buildings served by a municipal energy utility in the Metro were removed from the requirement to benchmark. That's a change from what you saw in the bill when you had it in committee last week. Sections 29 through 32 are from the governor's bill, extending the solar for schools program and making technical changes. At the top of page 78, section 33 is from Senator Mitchell's Senate file 2747, establishing a distributed energy resources system upgrade program. Section 34 is from Senator Port's Senate file 1404, establishing a solar for public buildings program. Section 35 is from Senate file 2876, creating an energy storage incentive program. Section 36 is another section from Senate file 1296, providing rebates for the purchase of new or used electric vehicles. Section 37 is another section from that same bill providing grants to dealers to obtain the training and equipment needed to sell electric vehicles. Section 38 is Senator Zhang, Senate File 2301, creating the Minnesota Cli Climate Innovation Finance Authority. Section 39 is from Senator McEwen's Senate File 2775, establishing a residential heat pump rebate program. Section 40 is from Senator Zhang, Senate File 1787, establishing a residential electric panel upgrade grant program. And I'll note there are some changes here as well. On page 104, you'll see that the maximum grant awards have been changed. In the bill that you discussed last week, I think that was last week, the maximum amounts were 6,000, 4,000, uh, and 9.5 thousand. Those have been reduced to 3,000, 2,000, and 5,000. Moving on to section 41, Senator Frentz's Senate file 1688 requires the PUC to issue an order on community solar garden requirements in light of the changes made elsewhere in the bill. That's actually Senate file 2688. I misspoke there. Section 42 is Senator Matthews, Senate file 1171 requiring an advanced nuclear study. Section 43 is Senator Kunish's Senate file 1968 requiring facilitation of the establishment of a tribal advocacy council on energy. Section 44 is Senator Frentz's Senate file 3030, the other bill you heard uh, earlier today, establishing grid resiliency grants. Section 45 is another section from Senate file 2301, providing for initial appointments of the Climate Innovation Finance Authority. Section 26 is the language from Senator Putnam, Senate file 2513, supporting investment in green fertilizer. And the final section is section 47, repealing sections replaced by other sections related to PUC dispute resolution and charging of a fee for charging an EV in the Capitol complex. All right. Um I think we have the next section section here coming up. Or that 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 should be it. Uh, Chair Friends, you have any additional comments for the I, committee? I do. Um, this shouldn't come as any surprise, members, but I want to thank the staff. Um, you know how it is. The last few days, they're putting in uh, very long hours. Mr. Stanley, Mr. Bueller, Ms. Tomerdahl. Um, to the minority staff, thank you for all the work that you've done here. This is what we're putting out uh, to be discussed in earnest on Wednesday. 
and again, uh, very much anxious to have bipartisan support for the bill as we send it out of here. As you can see, uh, we put some funding into many of the ideas that the committee brought forward and very open-minded to further discussion about it. Um, we did not do everything the governor wanted, and I think that's appropriate for a separate branch of government. And we did not put every dollar onto everything everybody thought was a good idea. And with that, Mr. Chair, happy to have discussion here now or happy to um, have any further management of the bill that anybody wants. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Um, does members uh, have any questions for council or staff? Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, I guess a couple things. There's a couple things in there I kind of like. But <laughs> the, um, you know, after last uh, meeting's testimony, and I know a lot of work has gone into this, but just a couple things. I had a uh, retired uh, manager, a mechanical engineer from uh, XL, send me an email because I made the comment about a solar engineer saying everything north of, of uh, Oklahoma is not economically viable as far as solar panels. Well, he sent me an email. I had asked staff to forward it to all of you, and in there, he basically sends me a copy of a map, two maps actually, that shows the viability of solar in the United States. And to tell you the truth, Minnesota, it is not viable, okay, because of our changing seasons. So this is a waste of money in many cases. And let me just add one more thing. Um, and tomorrow I'll try and say something positive, okay? <laughs> but, uh, you know, first we pass SF4 to drive up the cost exponentially to all our co-ops and, and uh, to the rate payers of the state of Minnesota, in my opinion, without any impact on the, uh, the climate or on the environment. Uh, any measurable impact. In fact, it's going to be a huge disaster when we got to clean all that stuff up. Um, then we come along, after we raise the cost, then we come along with the $15 million for resiliency. So first we drive the cost up for these co-ops and, and for electric rate payers. And then evidently we have empathy for them because they said there's no technology to get to the SF4. So then we come along with a bill, well, here's $15 million to try to help you solve the cost. I mean, you know, it reminds me of Milton Friedman's uh, quote, if you put the federal government, and you can extend it to state, in charge of the Sahara Desert, in five years you have a shortage of sand, okay? In other words, it's just way over micromanaging uh, what's going on. We'd be better off to allow the market to do it, and the environment would be better off, is my opinion. Again, there's a few bills in there, I would, but I'd like a, uh, a delete all that would include repealing SF4. Just my suggestion, thank you. Uh, Senator Fritz. Thank you, thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Um, every member on the committee brings a lot to our discussions and you're one of them. Here's what I wrote down. There's a couple things in the bill that I kind of like. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other uh, member comments? Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, there's a couple things in the bill that I like, too. Uh, there's an advanced nuclear study. I got that in the bill. A um, lot of things that we had uh, some pretty vigorous debate on others, on a bunch of other proposals that are in the bill. Uh, I do want to ask you one question, Senator Frentz, uh, walking through in the RDA part of the spreadsheet. The energy transition grant program was funded at $5 million, and the governor's budget, as well as the bill, was requesting $10 million for the host communities uh, with that program. So wondering uh, why you arrived at the $5 million number. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. I can see the committee administrator waving at me, so I'm going to allow him to make a comment, and then I'll address the question if that's okay, Mr. Chair, Mr. Emmerich. Mr. Emmerich. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Matthews, there is $5 million, uh, or the, the general fund portion is going to be funded out of the Jobs Committee budget. Uh, we put RDA to cover the XL territory for the community transition grants. 
Okay. Senator Matthews. So, Mr. Chair, I'm gathering it will total $10 million from two separate bills. Is that fair? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Yes, that's my understanding. And I have spoken with the chair of the corresponding jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments, Senator Matthews? Uh, other member questions, comments? All right. Uh, Senator Friends, closing remarks? Not really. I mean, Mr. Chair, members, uh, you know, the work we're doing here is for the benefit of Minnesotans, for the benefit of the utilities. And I, you know, I appreciate the collaboration we brought up to this point. Now the rubber meets the road. We got to make some decisions. I'm sure we'll be hearing from our constituents about tweaking some of the choices that we made. And I'm in touch with the chair of the other body of our corresponding committee. And believe me, their budget's going to look a little different. But whether you're interested in advanced nuclear study or heat pumps or electric vehicle rebates or electric buses or just simple straightforward support for co-ops and munis, I think this bill's going to reflect some good work and everyone on the committee will be able to be a part of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, members. Uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was expecting there to be more questions, so I, uh, I uh, didn't have uh, anything more on the bill, but I wanted to ask Senator Frentz logistically, um, Wednesday, are you taking public testimony? Can you walk through what our expectations should be Wednesday? Uh, and and uh, from here to then, uh, just the path forward for this bill. Thank you. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. We actually chatted that up this morning. I think our plan is to take written testimony on Wednesday. Um, but it was based on some estimates that I don't know that are very firm about how much time we have. And so I'm open-minded as the ranking member if you want to talk a little bit about that before Wednesday. And obviously the path would be to mark up the bill, pass it out of here, send it where it goes, and then I'm near positive that it will not match up with our good friends in the other body and that there'll be a need for a conference committee. It's not a big secret that the anticipation is that the conference committee would include both energy and environment. Um, so that stay tuned. Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair and Senator Friends, I'm going to strongly urge you to take uh, public testimony on Wednesday. I think it would be a serious mistake to cut that off from the public and uh, require only written testimony. Um, this was just brought to us a couple hours ago this morning. I know we've got two days to chew on it. Uh, but the public has the right to come and give their feedback uh, to us about this bill, things they like or don't like in it. And uh, so I want to register that. I urge you to allow for that on Wednesday's hearing. Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, thank you, Senator Matthews. Just the fact that you want there to be in-person testimony moves the needle, in my opinion, towards in-person testimony. How about we do this? Um, we have uh, left the door open for in-person testimony, notwithstanding our estimates about how much time. We intend to welcome every voice, whether it's written or in person. And if people start saying, I don't want to submit written testimony, I want to testify in person, I'm very open-minded to that. Fair enough? All right. Uh, and with that any further questions with that we will lay this bill uh, on the table for our Wednesday hearing I think, Mr. Chair I think you should uh, take a vote on the motion to lay it on the table sure. okay and with that uh, Senator Friends moves to lay the bill on the table all those in favor say aye aye, aye. all those opposed say nay all right, motion passes, and the bill is laid on the table for our Wednesday hearing. Thank you.